Looking at the scores as I was entering them, I saw that scores, uh, not surprisingly, for some people went down pretty quite, quite a bit. Um, there were a few people whose scores went up, uh, but most people's scores went down, and in some cases they went down a pretty good chunk. So um, if you're having um, problems understanding the material, please let me know. I can, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm also happy to help you uh, to find uh, a tutor if you need a tutor or, or uh, whatever. And I've, I've got uh, hopefully a couple of students who are going to do that. I know a couple of you have been looking. So um, the uh, students, is it, well, I, I'll, I'll ask later. But um, the next exam is uh, a rel fairly quick one. Uh, it's a week from Friday. So that probably means we'll have less material on it, which may be a benefit for you. But again, don't be complacent. I want you to dig in and, and get on top of the material. It's important uh, to obviously do that. So if you have questions about your grade or anything that's not obvious from here, uh, please come and see me, and I'll be happy to meet with you, talk with you, et cetera. So uh, hopefully we can get that going. OK, questions, comments? Yeah. Right, so that range for, say, C would be from about here to about here. C plus here, C, C minus, something like that. Yeah. Is there any way to move the exam to Monday? In general, I don't do that unless I have unanimity. Um, the first exam we moved it was a little unusual. It was a little unusual circumstance. Um, if everybody wants to move to Monday, I'll do it. But if there are those who don't, then I, I generally won't do that. Um, does anybody object to moving it to Monday? Well, maybe you've got something on Monday. Okay, so I, I do see some objections to moving it to Monday. So since this has been on the calendar for some time, then, I, then I'll, I'll leave it here. Sorry. Originally, I put it on Friday because I thought that was Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> I figured you'd want to have the exam before the weekend, but then I realized later it wasn't Memorial Day weekend, but by then the exam was already, already set. So, If I move it to Monday, that would also include more material. So that's the other flip side of it as well. So, Okay, so... Um, Let's turn our attention back to viruses. I'm not going to talk about the immune system. I think that's overkill for what we need to do here. So I'll be skipping over the immune system completely, and you will not be responsible for the immune system. OK? All right. Um, well, I want to say a bit about retroviruses. Last time I talked a little bit about retroviruses, and I talked about HIV and the fact that HIV goes through a DNA phase that it can integrate into the host uh, chromosomes. And um, that obviously is very bad if you are um, not wanting to suffer from um, HIV uh, slash AIDS, all right? But there is a positive side to this, and the positive side is that retroviruses offer tools uh, for perhaps manipulating the genome. Tools for perhaps manipulating the genome. Specifically, one of the things that we want to do in dealing with or treating genetic disorders, genetic disease, is to correct defects that are there. And to correct the defects that are there, what you would like to do would be to have something that is readily transmissible from one cell to the next, and second, is able to actually insert DNA into the chromosomes because then whenever those cells divide, they're going to proliferate and uh, have that good copy of the gene that's there. So retroviruses are looked upon as a way of engineering cells to um, contain sequences that we would like them to have. If that's a human being, we might be trying to cure a disease. If that is an animal, we might be trying to cure a disease. We might be trying to uh, insert something in there that might make the animal uh, more beneficial uh, for perhaps uh, breeding purposes, for any other purposes that might be out there. And if it's a plant, uh, there are other tools that are available. So there are tools besides retroviruses. Retroviruses don't show up much in plants as such. Um, but there are other tools for manipulating plants that are out there that allow us to do these things. So the qualities of a retrovirus are very, very useful uh, for inserting DNA, inserting sequences into uh, DNAs. Okay, and. This shows some of the genes that are present in retroviruses in general and HIV in specific. We won't 
uh, worry too much about the, speci uh, the specifics of what HIV has. But I think it's useful for you to understand the general structure of a retrovirus in terms of genes. Okay? Retroviruses almost always contain these three genes. HIV is a little bit odd in that respect, but they almost always contain coat proteins, which are the proteins on the outside, envelope proteins, which are proteins on the inside, and reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase, of course, you should remember, is necessary for converting that RNA into DNA. Okay. Now, um, HIV also contains an integrase, uh, which specifically will put DNA into a host chromosome. DNAs by themselves um, can also get integrated, so it doesn't necessarily take an integrase to do that. So some retroviruses make DNAs that cells look upon and actually say, oh, wow, I'm going to put this in the genome, and they actually do that. So yes, ma'am. Sure. So the three genes are coproteins, which are proteins that are on the outside of the virus, envelope proteins, which are on the inside of the virus, and reverse transcriptase, which is the enzyme that converts the RNA into DNA. And so all retroviruses start out as RNA, and they all go through a DNA phase, which means they have to have something that converts the RNA into DNA, and they have reverse transcriptase. And virtually every reverse transcriptase that's out there is very, very error prone. It's not just unique to HIV. Most, reverse, most uh, retroviruses have error prone reverse transcriptases. Okay. Now, uh, let's see here. This uh, simply shows schematically what I was describing to you that we might do in a, um, an engineering of a cell to actually get, get a uh, set of genes or gene that we want to put into there. And it's just basically using the various uh, components of the retroviral uh, life cycle in order to um, accomplish inserting it into the genome. Okay. Well, as I said, I'm going to skip over the immune system. We will not talk about the immune system. But I want to say something about a topic that's of interest to many, many people, and that's cancer. So understanding a little bit about the molecular basis of cancer allows us to understand what uh, a difficult, challenging disease that is and also helps us to uh, begin to think of ways that we could treat that disease. Okay? Now, um, a little terminology to start with. Okay, so first of all, uh, the terminology is uh, something called an oncogene. I want to talk about what an oncogene is. An oncogene is a gene that causes cancer. Okay, a gene that causes cancer. Yes, sir. Good question. So most uh, certainly retroviruses have a fairly random insertion about where that goes, which is one of the dangers with them. Because if you think about it, if you insert uh, into uh, places where you activate genes that shouldn't be activated, you could have some problems. And so one of the goals of uh, using retroviruses is to find targeting mechanisms so that you can target specific things. And that, that work is still uh, ongoing. But yeah, good question. There are some viruses um, that do insertions um, that insert at specific places, but they're generally not retroviruses. Okay, okay um, so oncogenes. Oncogenes are genes that cause cancer. Right? That's a simple definition. That's a simple thing. Genes that cause cancer. Now, when we think about that, we think, well, where do those genes come from? Do they come from outer space? Do they come from the moon? Where do they come from? And the answer is, they come from us. Now, do you have oncogenes in you? Well, probably not. But you have related genes called proto-oncogenes. Okay? So we need to define these two terms distinctly. An oncogene is a mutated version of a cellular gene. And that mutated version can cause cancer. So an oncogene is a mutated gene, mutated copy of a cellular gene, and that mutated copy can cause cancer. 
Well, then what is a proto-oncogene? A proto-oncogene, you can see the naming that happened with these. Oncogenes were named first, and then we realized these were coming from our cells. We had to call the original gene proto, meaning, meaning primordial or early. Okay. A proto-oncogene is a cellular gene that's involved in critical cellular processes. Okay? So a proto-oncogene is a cellular gene that's involved in critical cellular processes. Now, that's fairly general. I'm going to give you some examples of some critical cellular processes that proto-oncogenes uh, 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 perform. Okay? There are two or three hundred proto-oncogenes in your body, meaning that if you mutate those the wrong way, you're going to develop, or you could develop, a tumor. Okay? All right. So, some important cellular functions. Well, one is cells need to know when to divide and when not to divide. So, the controls on cell division, we might find some proto-oncogenes controlling that. We find some proto-oncogenes respond to signals to divide. So your body will tell certain uh, cells by using hormones to tell them to divide. Bone cells, as you're growing, for example, have to be told to divide. Right? So if you have something that is being told to divide by a hormone and it's not responding properly, maybe it thinks it's getting a hormone all the time, that is going to be causing uncontrollable growth and cause a cancer. Okay. There's two very obvious examples of where proto-oncogenes could, um, if they malfunction, cause some problems. Because in either case, when they malfunction, they don't listen to the outside world. Okay. They don't control things as they're supposed to, and they let this uncontrolled growth go on and on and on and on. I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples of that. Does that make, do those make sense, though? Okay, so proto-oncogenes are pretty important oncogenes, all right? What I want to talk about um, is um, this uh, couple of genes right here called RAS, okay? RAS is a very important proto-oncogene, and RAS is involved in helping the cell to decide whether or not to divide. It's involved in helping the cell to decide whether or not to divide. When RAS is activated, the cell is stimulated to divide. And when RAS is not activated, the cell is not stimulated to divide. Okay? So I don't have a figure for this, so let me just talk you through it. So in any event, the decision for a cell to divide is not a single thing. RAS participates in a decision-making process. But if RAS is activated, it's starting that process saying, we want to divide. Then the next protein in the, in the system will take that information and say, RAS wants to divide, get ready to pass on the information. So this is going to pass on information through several levels, ultimately causing a cell to divide. Okay? Now, there are several different RASs inside of your cell because they, they all play roles in this process. RAS um, has an interesting property. The way RAS is activated is RAS binds to the nucleotide GTP. Okay, RAS binds to GTP. When RAS is bound to GTP, it is stimulated to tell the cell to divide. Okay. Well, when does RAS get bound to GTP? RAS is normally bound to GDP. RAS is normally bound to GDP. Somewhere, okay, outside the cell, a signal comes, and it's a hormone, and it binds to a protein in the membrane of the cell, and the message of that protein is, we want you to divide. Okay? Make sense? That causes the GDP, which is in the RAS, to be removed, and the GTP to be placed in there. So when RAS has GDP in it with, with the D, okay, it's just sitting there. It's doing nothing. 
But when that GDP becomes replaced by GTP, then 